they called you the Gladiator. How did that nickname come about? Mike Awesome is a wrestler that most are familiar with through his time in ECW as well as his ill-fated runs in WCW and the WWE. He was seen as a guy who checked all the boxes that a pro wrestler should and was always on the cusp of being the next big thing in the industry. But wrestling was not the original plan he had for his life. After uh, high school, I went to college. I mm -hmm. um, did three years of college, and uh, in my third year of college, actually before I went to college, I worked for a year to save money for college. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, like I said, after three years of college, talking with my cousin, uh, with Mike Belay, which is uh, Horace Hogan, right. and he said that he was talking with his uncle, because, you know, that, that's his uncle, uh, Hulk Hogan is, but it's not my uncle. But, and uh, he was talking about getting into wrestling, and him and I had kicked it around once before, but we were so skinny, we just, I don't know, we just didn't think we'd do. So he went on the road with Hogan for uh, a week, and he came off, and he said, Mike, it was great. He goes, we got to do it, let's do it, and boom, we, we started doing it. You know, we got trained, and we did it. Having family ties to Hulk Hogan would have been something most would exploit. However, Mike Awesome would set out to make his own name in the USWA and Florida's local wrestling scene as he began his wrestling journey. I was, uh, you know, wasn't making any money in wrestling. I already come off the USWA thing, uh, starved out of there, had a credit card bill, was wrestling for some local independents for free, wasn't getting paid, knew I wasn't getting paid, was actually their heavyweight champion, and mm -hmm. I knew there was no payday. So I was already back in college. I had already enrolled back into some college classes mm -hmm. when the scout for uh, FMW came across and saw me wrestling and said, hey, I was like to go to Japan in two weeks. So I had to make a decision right then and there. I was like, well, if I go to Japan, that means i got to drop back out of college again, and I probably won't go back. You know, I got to either do the wrestling or go back to college. So I went to Japan, and thank goodness, Omita gave me a job, and I had one for a long time. So, that, you know, I became a wrestler. From this moment forward, Mike Awesome would rapidly rise through the ranks, beginning primarily as a tag team partner with his cousin Horace Boulder until he would leave for WCW. He soon would join Terry Funk and the Funk Masters of Wrestling becoming one of the biggest heels in Japan at the time. His power-centric and high-impact style was like nothing else, and it was this very style that allowed him to stand out to anyone who saw him. Someone was saying that he should have just stuck to big guy moves, uh, and he wants to show you, you know, that he can do a, a moonsault and, a, and, and you know, a bunch of like high-flying moves, which, uh, you know, nobody wants to see him do. That was the context of what I was reading. It reminded me of the conversation we had. Somebody's response was, what about Mike Awesome? He was a really um, big guy, and uh, he didn't wrestle like a big guy at all. And I just wanted to comment on that. He definitely wrestled like a big guy. And that's, that's what was so amazing because he would run, dive over the top rope and land like hitting a clothesline with somebody against the guardrail. Like boom, that brutal footage of him and JT Smith where he folds him backwards over the guardrail. And what makes that so impressive is it definitely looks like a big guy doing that move, you know? <laughs> yeah. like, it's like a killer whale coming out of the water and splash, just water going everywhere. That's That was Mike Austin's style. And he wasn't doing a bunch of bat flips and landing on his feet and stuff like that. He wasn't taking clothes lines and wanting to do a, a flipping bump. So, you know, to that, I, I got to say, it was amazing that he would do that move. Um, he didn't do very many flying moves, and that's what made him still look like a really big guy doing the moves. It looked, you know, uh, action-packed, violent, hurtful, damaging. With his foot in the door, Onita and the higher-ups gave him the gladiator name, and the time had come for the big man to conquer Japan. Made his 
During Mike Awesome's rise in Japan, he would take part in one of the most dangerous and famous death matches in the history of FMW, where he and the other participants would wrestle in a giant swimming pool that was rigged with explosives. You had a match, this was one of the most insane things I had seen you do. You had a match when you were wrestling in an Olympic swimming pool, and there was... Oh, yeah. Um, for the American fans who never got a chance to see you do things like that, I mean, would you, would you tell them to go buy a tape of that or something of that effect? Is that you something know, you're proud of? Yeah, actually, I am proud of that. You, I, I, I'm very proud of it because we did some crazy stuff, and Onita, he was an innovator, and I just happened to be right there with him while it was all going on, and I'm proud to, the, to be the... I'm, I'm proud to say that, yeah, a little boat took me out to the ring. There were bombs laid out in the water. There was electrified barbed wire, which, you know, wasn't really electrified. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but the, you know, the bombs in the water, they were they were really dangerous. They actually told us, they said, look, don't land on these things. If you do, you can get seriously hurt. Make sure you don't land on them. We're like, oh, great, you know. Right. Never had that thrown at me before, but you know nobody got hurt, nobody drowned. They had a they had a swimmer there, but yeah, I'm proud. I'm proud to be a part of all that. Very proud. After Onita would leave the company, they began to lean more on the Gladiator to be one of their top stars. Terry Funk and Onita had previously been the biggest stars for the company, and both of them leaving left the door wide open for new stars like the Gladiator, Hayabusa, and Masato Tanaka to take the top spots of the company. In a situation that can be seen similar to how the World Wrestling Federation was left after Hulk Hogan left them with Bret Hart and Yokozuna after WrestleMania 9, FMW would now see a downturn in business but a new emphasis on the in-ring product. The death matches were toned down and FMW became entertainment oriented with elements of hardcore wrestling thrown in. The Gladiator would win a tournament to become the first champion of the new era and would even go on to be the longest reigning champion in the history of FMW. His run with the company was one of dominance where he would clash with the other two top stars but rarely lose to either of them, keeping him very protected and wins over him much more meaningful. Hayabusa would chase a victory over the Gladiator for a long while before finally getting his revenge for losing in the tournament final. Their matches were a true highlight of both men's careers as they had a great chemistry and were willing to push each other's limits. Uh, my career highlight would be when I won the FMW Heavyweight Championship for the first time, yeah, because that was um, the accumulation of a lot of years of struggling and really struggling and trying to make it in the wrestling business and it, it was like my first really big accomplishment to be the heavyweight champion of a major company you know in japan such as uh, fmw as good as his matches with hayabusa were there is no comparison to the impact his matches with masato tanaka had on not only himself but the industry as a whole Um, one of the feuds you had in Japan that carried over to America later on was against Masato Tanaka. How do you yeah. enjoy working with Masato? Uh, that was great, you know. Um, it was great working with him. We had some really great matches. It's just every time, though, that I know I've got to work him, mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm on edge because I know that he's going to beat the hell out of me. And I know he, he, I know he's not liking it because he knows I'm going to beat the hell out of him. We just beat the hell out of each other and we had this chemistry. And, you know, it's not like we're really pissed off. Uh, we just had this chemistry where we go out there and we, we've worked so many hard, brutal matches in, in Japan with FMW before that we just, we continue to do it. Hmm. Not many people will go step in the ring and have matches the way Tanaka and I will have against each other. Masato Tanaka versus the Gladiator will go down as some of the most hard-hitting matches of all time, and being the likely reason for both men's explosion in popularity. They would exchange championships with each other in Japan as well as the States while taking the feud to ECW where Mike Awesome began to see his star rise even higher. 
The ECW audience loved what Mike Awesome brought to the table, and he was a perfect fit to be the company's world champion. His bouts with Tanaka were a perfect showcase for both men to the American audience, and their ECW bouts are discussed among American audiences to this day. ECW would leave a lasting impact on Awesome's popularity in many ways. It was even in ECW that Mike Awesome was convinced to change his signature hairstyle. Standing in the ring and these people keep yelling mullet out at me. I'm like, what the, you know, I wrestled in Japan for so long, I didn't know what the hell was going on in the States with style or anything. Right. And um, I had, I, I, I kind of leaned over at Jeff and said, Jeff, why do they keep yelling mullet? He goes, it's your haircut. And that's the first time I had ever heard that a mullet, you know, was a haircut style. <laughs> yeah, you know, so it's pretty incredible looking back on it. <laughs> While working for ECW, he continued to grow his name by also taking tours with All Japan Pro Wrestling, furthering himself as a top gaijin performer. Although things were seeming to be going near perfect for the gladiator, the reality was much different. He wanted to be closer to family and after being given promises of steady pay from Paul Heyman, had agreed to work for ECW. Things went well for a time, but it was not long before Paul Heyman's notorious trait of not paying his wrestlers would begin to put a strain on the relationship until it would reach a breaking point. Uh, basically, I was driving to the show, and I was thinking to myself, you know what? We did not get paid last week. We're not getting paid this week. What's going on? Why, why do they keep missing our paydays? They just kept, you know, we get paid sporadically. Right. And just kept missing paydays and missing paydays. And I was like, thinking, what did I do? I left my job in Japan for this. I just bought the house that I'm doing this interview in right now. I started thinking, oh my gosh, I'm not even going to be able to make my mortgage payments. So, uh... I was talking to Horace actually on the telephone and he said, Mike, he goes, what are you doing? He goes, I can't believe you're doing that. He goes, I got Hulk Hogan right next to me. Boom, he hands the phone to Hogan. Hogan gets on the phone with me, brother, 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 what are you doing? You can't be working for free. He goes, just turn around and if I was you, I'd take my ass home. Basically, that's what I did. I turned around and went home. And uh, from there, started talking with Bischoff and Rusoff and Bischoff and Russo, and you know what happened then? Got a job. Mm -hmm. Then Paul and all the legal wranglings came down on me. And if I had a contract with Paul, I would not have been able to go to WCW. So, what, what, would, what was your solution? Were you, did you just want to get the belt back because you didn't have a contract? Or? Yeah, I could care less about the belt. I mean, the belt, so really, the belt, while I was there, and I was, even though I was the champion, it's cool to be the champion. Uh, you know, that's not everything, you know. Being able to provide for your family is number one, actually. So the belt meant absolutely nothing at that point because I, could, I wasn't providing properly for my family. And I felt like I made a bad career move by leaving Japan. Uh, my side of the story, basically, like I told you, could not provide for my family. Or, well, wasn't getting paid, basically. The checks just weren't coming in the way they were supposed to. All the promises that were, that were made were not coming to. I meant when, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have okay. your, your side of the story when you went back to drop the title. Oh, okay. Because they, they said, it was reported that you sat outside the front and you knocked on the locker room. Oh, yeah, I wasn't allowed in the locker room. Paul did not allow me in the locker room. I had a piece of paper that was faxed to me from Paul's attorney telling exactly what would go on. They said that they would have a hotel room, which they did not, and I didn't want their hotel room anyways. Um, they said they had the match lined out exactly how they wanted the match. They wanted me to be waiting outside until it was time for me to enter the ring and come in through the front door. They didn't want me in the dressing room. They didn't want any problems. They legally, everything was being conducted by the lawyers at that point. So they, both sides just wanted to make sure everything was going to go right and go smooth. Did you, uh, have, did you hear anything from people in the locker room, or, was, or do you think this was no. just Paul? Yeah, well, was, cause the, the ironic part, and I always thought that this might just be, a, you know, one of Paul's little angles from working right. everybody. I mean, he built it up for a week, oh, yeah. saying that he wasn't going to be in the locker room, he right. did this, you know, coincidentally, the house is packed. Right, oh yeah, oh gosh, it was, it was great, you know, even though everything that was going on, Loved it. it was great walking through that crowd. Everybody chanting, "You sold out! You sold out!" I felt good. I felt good about that. I knew I didn't sell out. 
do. I just had to provide for my family. And if they knew what was going on, they'd have done the exact same thing I did. After the situation being spun as him selling out by Heyman and the promotions fans, his relationship with Paul Heyman and ECW was finished. He had landed a job in WCW for a time, but it was unfortunately during the end times of the promotion. Timing, again, you come into an organization, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, take Tom Brady and throw him, you know, into the Detroit Lion roster. You know, it doesn't matter how great of, a, of, of an athlete or how big of a star a Tom Brady would be. Um, when you're surrounded by a team that is not functional, that isn't playing up to par, that doesn't have momentum, it doesn't matter. And I think, not, not that Mike Awesome was the Tom Brady of professional wrestling at that time, but Mike Awesome was a very talented guy. He had the right look, his head was squarely on his shoulders from a wrestling perspective. He was, he was smart. Yeah, he, he was good. But he wasn't smart enough or good enough to rise above just the lack of momentum and the dysfunction that was WCW in the year 2000. Mike Awesome would be picked up by the WWE when they purchased WCW and was the first man to win a championship in the alliance from a member of WWE's roster. Much like his time in WCW, his debut would be the highlight as things never clicked with him in the company and he soon found himself working in Japan again. With FMW now closed, Mike Awesome would find himself taking tours with All Japan Pro Wrestling and NOAA. He would even challenge Kenta Kobashi during his legendary reign as the holder of the Global Honored Crown. Some people have said that his work had suffered during this time period, but after having such horrible luck with knee injuries over his career, Awesome had toned down his style, and some would see it as an improvement of years before. Aside from very brief stints in TNA wrestling and Major League Wrestling, Mike Awesome was only seen in the States on a major level one more time, and it was to face his longtime rival, Masato Tanaka, at the WWE-sanctioned ECW reunion show. One more time, the two rivals would go as hard as they ever had before and show people what made their feud so special to begin with. Though many would get jobs with the company following the event, Mike Awesome was not offered a spot. His match was even publicly disliked by higher-ups within WWE. I didn't like the match because they didn't sell anything. And it, it after a while, all those chair shots and all all that crazy crap it means nothing um might as well one with a roll-up type thing because it, it just everything they had done to that point meant nothing so not a big fan of it but i'm not a fan of that type of match so there you go how do you answer critics that said that said fmw was garbage wrestling um, well, you know, maybe to some some people it is garbage wrestling. Maybe some people want to just see old style wrestling, you know, without cables, without um, chairs, without barbed wire, you know. So maybe it was garbage wrestling. I don't know, but it was where I had a job at, and it was a style of wrestling that that Onita wanted to do, and he was trying to get across in Japan, which it did get across. As a matter of fact, it. You know, look around. It caught on worldwide. So, you know, the critics, uh, you know, maybe to them it is garbage wrestling. Like I said, maybe they just want to see old star wrestling. I don't know. Mm. But that's what I say to them. Even without the support of the higher ups, the match was one of the loudest cheered bouts of the night, and the people in attendance showed that they still loved Mike Awesome and Masato Tanaka, bringing the spirit of FMW across the world to them. Unfortunately, this was the last match that the Gladiator would ever have. After the WWE passed him over, his life spiraled out of control and would meet a tragic end on February 17, 2007. He was 42 years old, 
Mike Awesome is known by a lot of people simply for being the big guy from ECW. But if Mike were here and could choose to be remembered for anything in his time during wrestling, I don't believe he would choose ECW or even the WWE. If, for, if your career was to end tomorrow, what would you say your career highlight would be? Uh, my career highlight would be when I won the FMW Heavyweight Championship for the first time.